So after LFS configuration issues, um, to me issues implies problems. They're not really problems, they're just things that need to be attended to really to make the system a bit more usable, I guess. Um, make it easy to configure and so on and uh, prepare it for some of the packages that will be built in in BLFS. Um, so it describes about text configuration and so on, um, how they use to configure things and drive things and so on. So create that in your own time. Um, so let's go through each of these items. The so first one's about creating custom boot device. Well, um, yeah, I guess LFS is like a doing it your own way. So you can do this if you want to. I've never bothered with this. Um, in the old days when it used to be Grub 0 point something and floppies were still in use, um, I did use to create a Grub boot floppy, which was quite useful if you did um, mess up the booting of the machine to have that floppy disk but these days with live and that's another thing live cds didn't exist then or live usbs then sometime in the mid early mid 2000s i think nopix was one of the first distributions if not the first distribution to create a live cd image which you could boot from and that was ideal for rescuing a system so if you do want to stick with the LFS way of doing things yourself then there's some instructions here um, it's even got about creating a rescue floppy but um, I was using Tom's root boot disk um, I didn't think that was still up that website but uh, I would say that the tools that are on there are well out of date and they're probably of very little use um, I seem to remember there was something with the EXT file system had some changed onto the inodes and older versions of the ext tools wouldn't be able to read partitions created with the newer, t newer tools because of these this change made so um, you might be able to use it for doing some very limited uh, rescue work but um, it's quite old now it's probably getting on for 10 years older uh, 20 yeah 20 years old probably even now um, yeah it says even there it's uh, Linux 2.6 um, no longer boots from a floppy so you can see this is a distribution that does boot from a floppy so it's got to be you know Linux kernel prior to that version um, as it says here there's several resources can be used for a rescue CD-ROM I'd say just about well it says there just about every commercial distribution has got one that you can boot from CD, DVD or even that these images these days are hybrid uh, you can copy them to USB and boot from a USB assuming your hardware can boot from USBs <clears throat> again the Linux from scratch live CD that's quite out of date I think it's at least 10 years out of date if not 15 out, years out of date so again I think it's got similar limitations to Tom's root boot floppy disk image um, although I think because it's on a CD it's got a few more tools I can't remember if it's a graphical um, has a graphical front end I don't think it does because I seem to remember it only occupied about half a CD but um, yeah if that link still works then obviously you've got that but I, I would say you know whatever distribution you use as your host that would be more than adequate to um, use as a rescue disk um, so let's move on to the next oops what have I done there next option console font so I'll briefly touch this on an earlier video where you can change um, the console file in the um, etc sysconfig directory to modify the console font if you wish to do that um, so I won't go through this again um, uh, and as you can see, it mentions the terminus font there, but I couldn't see that in the listing. Whether that's um, part of the text here to install that. Um, but as you saw, I installed the terminus font that's available in the kernel, which is what you're looking at now. Um, so again, I'm not going to cover this in any more detail, but it goes into detail about uh, obtaining 
other fonts and activating them. Firmware, this describes about installing firmware for certain hardware. There's a chance I might need to do that, um, but I'm only going to go through that as and when. So if it's not needed, I won't be bothering about this. Um, is, if it is needed, then obviously I'll go through it and show you how to do that. Um, but you can read about it here anyway. There's a bit about microcode. So I'm not going to be bothering to show you that. It's um, it can get quite technical. So I think again, this is the sort of thing that might veer away a little bit from what BLFS is all about. But there's plenty of information there about how to set it up and the different types of um, ways. There's two main ways of loading microcode. So I'll skip all that as I say. About devices, um, so this is about multiple sound cards. Again, I'm not going to dwell on these too much. If you've got two sound cards, that's uh, an exception to Rob. Definitely, probably a musician, um, I guess, um, or he may have some special reason for having two sound cards. So, um, again, this information is here for managing those sound cards and how to configure to ensure they work correctly. Uh, some other information there for multiple DVD or CD drives. Again, that's probably an exception. Um, I did have, um, I think, a couple of machines with two CD drives in, but that was in the days when CD writers were quite new, and they were just CD writers. Um, they were very limited in speed, so you, you tend to have a, a separate CD-ROM, um, which would be faster and also enable you to copy from one to to the writer on the fly um, for duplicating but that's uh, something that's not really done and a lot of machines these days don't come with CD-ROMs anyway so uh, again that's probably a bit more of a specialised thing if you've got two optical devices to, to support um, so what we've gone on to adding users okay so this is where we're going to start doing some work it talks about how to add a user here, various options. Um, so you can see it says here about uh, using this command here to see the defaults available. So you can either edit or look at this file here. So if we copy that first, it's copied to full stop, not to worry. So if we cat that, remove the full stop, you can see there the defaults that are. Uh, enabled for every new user that's added to the system so um, for example you know, a new user will get a bash shell prompt by default and um, the user will be put in home directory for example Uh, so yeah, we can do we can get the same information by using this command here. So if you run the user add program, basically with the minus capital D option, you can see exactly the same information comes up. So it's obviously just reading that file and reporting the same information back. Um, so what it's now talking about is this etc scale directory and it's scale stands for skeleton and what it does it, it holds skeleton files configuration files which are used for users um, for when they log in uh, to it basically allows you to set some defaults for every user um, when they uh, when their account is created and then obviously the user can modify these files because they've become part of their um, home directory. So this doesn't initially exist so we need to create this directory so let's create it and I'm going to start using the copy and paste a bit more because it just saves typo errors so I've double clicked that, move back here, center click and so I've created that directory now. So 
see it's empty and you can see that the root's got read write access to it and other users have got read only access to it um, debatable whether you'd want to let other people have read access to it um, they can look at it every user that's created on the system will get a copy of what's in this directory anyway so I can't see any real reason for stopping um, anybody looking at it um, you may have other reasons for changing permissions but I think defaults would be sufficient so I'll move back here and um, as you can see it says um, that any files from this part of the book that you put in the ETC scale should be writable only by the owner so there's the root basically in this case and since there's no telling what kind of sensitive information the user may eventually place in their copy of these files you should also make them unreadable by group and other okay so basically it's saying that any file we create should be read write with no other permissions so rewrite for the user with no other permissions so that's something we'll need to do when we create the files uh, you can also put other files in the ETC scale and different permissions may be, may be needed for them uh, decide which initialization files initialization files should be provided in every or most users home directory the decisions you make will affect what you do in the next two sections some or all of these files will be useful for root um, any existing users and new users so I've deliberately not created a user at the moment just so that when I create a normal user you can see how this works but um, as it says it may um, some or all these files may be useful for even existing users so if I did have an existing user I'd be creating them for these files and then I'd potentially want to copy them into an existing user assuming that I wouldn't be overwriting any existing um, uh, file and it says here some of these files you might want to create into etc scale include input rc bash profile bash rc bash logout dir colors and vimrc and if you're in sh unsure which of these should be placed there just continue with the following sections read it section to any references provided and then make your decision so basically it's saying it's suggesting you may want to put all of these in there for every user to have them you run a slightly modified set of commands for files which are placed in etc scale each section will remind you of this. In brief, the book's commands have been written for the files not added to the ETC scale and just adds them to the user's home directory. So basically what I'm going to do is create these files and it will be creating them as it says there for the root, direct, uh, for the root user because that's the only user that's um, active at the moment on the system. So it does mean that once I've created the files, I'll have to copy them to the ETC scale. Um, as it says here, the file's going to be put into the ETC scale, change the books commands, send the output there instead of uh, instead and then just copy the file from ETC scale to the appropriate directories like ETC squiggle which is the home directory or the home directory of any other user already on the system and then when adding, adding a user with user add the minus m command or the sort of parameter tells the user add to create the home directory and also copy the files that are in ETC scale into the home directory so that again this is why I've left the creation of the um, uh, unprivileged user till after I've done these files just so I can show this so I can show this in operation so it's a bit here about systems and groups um, how you add them and so on where the files are stored so I'm not going to dwell on this too much uh, it gives a list of suggested values for user IDs and group IDs and it's more for information list than anything else because as we go through the book if there is a necessity for a package to have a user the instructions to, for creating that user and or the group will already exist and um, uh, the correct group or user ID as it's displayed here will be detailed for that package so it's not something you need to worry about but you can use this table as a reference
So the bash start shell startup files. So um, these are files that are read um, either at login or when the user uh, account starts up. Um, and details the various um, configuration files that are there. Um, yeah, talks about more of them at the top. Most instructions below are used to create files located in the etc directory structure which requires you to execute commands as root user. If you elect to create the files in the user's home directories instead you should run commands as an unprivileged user. So I'm going to be installing into the etc um, and then copying them into the etc scale. So first of all is etc profile. Here is a base etc profile. This file starts by setting up some helper functions and basic parameters. It specifies some batch history parameters and for security purposes disables keeping a permanent history file for the root user. It also sets the default user prompt. It then calls small single purpose scripts in the etc profile D directory to provide most of the initialization. So this is quite an important um, configura configuration file because it, it calls, as it says, it calls upon other um, uh, configuration files. So if you do create the other configuration files, they won't normally be read unless you've got this or you've got some other method of them being read and processed. So let's start off by copying and pasting this then. So once again, I'm just going to copy everything from the beginning of the command, including all the text that's going to be pasted, switch back centre click to paste that in, move back again, page for the next page, space for the next page, sorry, again copies as, as much as I need to, which is virtually all, but no more, switch back, centre click, switch back again, space for the next page, here's another page, and lastly, this is the last line of that script we need to copy and once again we can just examine it to make sure it looks sane. So yeah, it starts with comments, that looks all good and there's the end comment saying it ends it so there should be, a, yeah there's a beginning one as well so that shows we've copied all of it correctly. So the etc profile.d directory now create the etc profile directory where the individual initialization scripts are placed. So we'll copy all of this command, paste that in. It's done. So we can look to see if that's there. And you can see there's the profile uh, script we just created, and there's the profile.d directory just been created. So there's a bash completion script here. It says it's controversial. Not all users like it. And it explains why there. I tend to put it in. It can be useful for some packages. So once again, do, do the same as before. Switching between the virtual terminals, copying and pasting everything that's needed. Once again, I'll just check that that looks okay. Yep, that looks to be all there. So it looks like the copying and pasting is working okay. Make, need to make sure that a directory exists for bash completion. So I'll create that with that command. Uh, more detailed explanation, there's a link there. Now we've got the colors.sh script, so this will allow um, directories and files to be highlighted in colors. So that's that one created. Extra paths, this script adds some useful paths to the path. 
and can be used to customize other paths related environment variables, e.g. E LD library paths that may be used, needed for all users. So let's start by copying this one. This line here. Next page. Continue with the contents. Next one is readline.sh. The script sets up the default input RC configuration file. If the user does not have individual settings, it uses the global file. Okay. Then umask.sh. Setting the umask value is important for security. Here, the default group write permissions are turned off for system users, and when the username and group name are not the same. So copy and paste all of that, I'll include the carriage return. So where I've copied up to that point, this can be quite important actually when copy and pasting. There's no carriage return at the end of what I'm copying because the highlighting has ended at the end of the text. So if I paste this in, you'll see the cursor's left there and I've got to put the carriage return in manually. However, if I copy and paste like that, um, so if I go past where the line of text is, if I can highlight it, if I go one further or onto the next line, the whole line gets highlighted, which indicates that the carriage turn or the new line character rather um, at the end of that line has been copied. As you can see, when I paste it in, I don't need to press enter after the EOF because that, that um, end of line marker has been copied. Um, so now we're going on to the internationalization script. Now this um, needs to be set the same. I think we've already overwritten it actually. Um, it would have been good. I think that was originally in the original profile. So what I'm going to have to do is to recall from memory what this should have been set to and modify it. Um, and if you can't remember what it was set to, you'd have to go back to the LFS book to see how it's um, set. I forgot about this, that it gets overwritten. So what I need to do is to go into this file and set this back. So the LL is the language, so for me that's EN, English. CC is the country code, so that's GB in my case. Uh, I don't have any modifiers, but the char map is um, ISO 88591. And I just need to check the um, layout of that because um, this varies this layout. Sometimes the ISO is in capitals, sometimes there's a hyphen between ISO and 8859, sometimes there's another hyphen between the 59 and the 1. So I'm just going to check on another machine of mine, um, another LFS machine that I've actually got the correct layout um, for that. In fact, I might be able to, I'll save that. Um, locale. see what it does by itself. Right, yeah, I think it's this that I need to set. So that's how it should be formatted. So it's all in capitals and it needs the hyphens. Oh yes, it is actually exporting lang, so that's good. So you can see the current. Okay, so you don't need to go to the um, LFS to find out. As long as you haven't rebooted between overwriting the profile it should be sufficient to echo lang uh, and that's the value that you need to copy and paste into this file here so just to be sure I'm going to delete all that shift A to append center click to paste and that's all that's needed for that file I will just check the other LFS machine that I've got. I've got a little server that I use, a Pentium Pro server um, that I've always had as an LFS machine, just a lightweight uh, web server and uh, SVN server as well. 
So let me just get into that machine. Uh, where is this profile? Dot D I eighteen. Yes, that is right. Okay, so that's good. So let's switch back, that's that one done. Now we've got a bash RC. Uh, it says here comments should explain everything you need, so there's no actual explicit comments at the beginning of this script. So as we go through you'll see the, there's plentiful comments describing everything that's being done, so you can read that at the time you do this. to make sure it looks okay. Oops. Bash RC wasn't it? No. Which one was that? Oh it was yeah ETC. Sorry that was Bash RC in ETC. Bash RC. Yep that looks okay. Right, now um, there's some other options just before we carry on. There's some other options I normally add here which enhance the bash functionality. They're purely optional, but I'll add them in um, in case you want to add them yourself. Um, first one is called, um, well, it's for history append. So what it does is when you um, write something in the terminal, this option will append to the history file rather than overwrite it. So it can be useful for keeping commands when you've um, got several terminals open. Um, it could be quite useful. Yeah, that's it, shot minus s history append. The next one I use is a command to make the um, commands that you type in append, uh, sorry, go to the history file immediately. So that means if you log out or um, you're on an SSH link and it drops, um, it won't forget the commands that you've written because they've been written to the history file immediately. Uh, I believe normally what happens, all the history gets written when you close the connection uh, cleanly, that is. Uh, but this, as I say, will write each command as they're entered straight away to the history file. So you're less chance of losing a, a command it might want to come back to if it's a particularly complex or big command. That could be quite useful. So this option is prompt. And it's, got, it's actually an environment variable. Command prompt underscore command equals history minus a so it looks like it's setting an append flag there with the minus a um, another one which can be quite useful is um, to tell bash that when you use control D to quit the shell that to be sure that you actually did mean to quit and you didn't accidentally press control D um, that the, the requirement is that you press it twice so what this option is it's another environment variable ignore um, EOF equals one um, so that means that if I was to say for example say I was logged in at this terminal here if I log in the control D it logs me out straight away with that option I'll show you when I log in because we'll have to re-log re in or resource these files 
you'll have to press Control D twice. It'll actually come up the first time you press Control D. It'll come up with a prompt saying, you know, press Control D again to log out. So that can be quite useful if you're a bit bit keen, bit trigger happy on the Control D button to log out of a prompt. And that work on a remote connection as well. So if you SSH in, um, that will work there as well. You have to press Control D twice. It says um, use log out to leave the shell when you when you do Control D for the first time, and you either just do Control D again or type log out to actually quit. Also, while I'm here, I'm going to um, set some other uh, environment variables, which are the C flags and the CXX flags and the make flags, so that for every package that we install, these actives are always available in the environment. So I'm going to type in export C flags. As I said before, I'm going to um, ensure that uh, most, it won't apply to every single package because of the way they build, but most packages should recognize and act upon these flags. So I'm going to, just going to use native. Um, you can use whatever settings you want here, but native, native seems to be generally quite a good setting, especially for more modern CPUs. I'm not so, so sure of its value for um, older CPUs so much. And pipe just creates um, data structures in memory rather than on the disk, temporary data structures, so it can speed up compilation a little bit. And then CXX flags, I just set this to the value of C flags and the advantage of that is that you only have to adjust the settings for C flags and CXX flags will automatically follow what C flags is set to um, unless you specifically want to set different C flags, uh, CXX flags from C flags. That's just a quick method of getting that to uh, replicate in CXX flags. And the last one I'm going to set is make flags. So I can set this to um, the number of jobs I want to run in parallel. Well, I've got four cores, so it makes sense to um, set that to four. Um, and that's it really for that. So I'll save that. So we've augmented the default bash RC already. Um, as I say, they won't be activated yet because we'd have to source these. Uh, I believe that gets done towards the end of this section. Um, so that was the bash RC. We've now got a bash profile. There's a base bash, bash profile. If you want each user to have this file automatically, just change the output of the command to etc scale bash profile and check permissions after the command is run. So what I'm going to do is to copy this for the bash user, uh, for the root user, sorry. Um, switch to the terminal. So that's copied. And then I'm going to copy the file. into etc scale and I'll do the permissions after I've copied all the files there um, save me having to do each individual one I can just change them automatically uh, and one thing to remember is this is if I do a listing it's a hidden file so this has caught me out a few times when you come to look at ETC, the files in etc scale you think well I've copied something there but you've got to remember that they are hidden, so you need to use the minus A um, dash A option with LS to actually view them. And if I do a long listing, um, as you see, it's got read uh, permissions for anybody in the same group and anybody uh, and uh, anybody who's not in that group or not the owner, i.e., other. And as the recommendation in the LFS book was. Um, it's a good idea to disable that because the users will be um, getting these files. Likewise, it may be a good idea to change it for 
the root user as well because we've just created that file there it is there bash profile you can see most of the other files that have been automatically created um, not all of them for example this wget file has got read access for everybody else apart from the roots in the root group but a lot of the other ones are only accessible by the root so um, I might decide to change that it's possibly the fact that you wouldn't normally be downloading stuff as the root because it's potentially a security issue so that could be why that's just got that um, so it's probably nothing to worry about too much in this case and we haven't got another user anyway so we've, it's the only option we've got um, so I think I'll change those permissions on there afterwards as well just to be sure uh, just make it a bit easier so now we've got a custom profile file so once again I'm going to copy this as if it was for the root and then I'm going to copy that file into the etc scale as before move on to the next one we've got a personalized bash RC and you can see here that um, if the it's testing to see if the global bash RC file exists and if it is it sources it so that means that by default any new user will get access to all the settings in the bash RC that's been set uh, the global bash RC which includes the C flags which is good because I will be building stuff as a unprivileged user and also the make flags but more to that as you can see down here we can override the settings here so although they've got this export lang command remarked out the user could override the default one <clears throat> by uncommenting that and setting their own language settings there so it works quite nicely so that's that there we need to copy it dot bash rc into etc scale that's that one done now we've got a bash logout um, script a uh, config file rather um, it does say it doesn't include a clear command I think they did use to include a clear command here um, oh no it's yes that's right it is in the issue issue file and it's just a command uh, you could put the clear command in here but they've obviously put it in this issue file which we'll come to in a bit um, it just means that when you log out from the terminal the screen is cleared which could be a good thing from a security point of view you might not want the screen cleared if you want to see some messages after log out so that's a personal preference but as it says there it's not not done at this point so let's copy the logout file to etc scale again so again it's just a script where you put in commands that you might want to be run as the user logs out So etc is dir colors. If you want to use the dir colors capability and run the following command, the etc scale setup steps shown above can also be used here to provide a dot dir colors file when a new user is set up. So again, it means that there's going to be a global um, setting set by running this command, which we should do now. and also by copying it to dot dir colors in the etc skeleton directory it means that the users also can uh, also have a personalized file which they can modify themselves and it says as before just change the output file name on the following command well i'm actually going to copy the file rather than run this command with different parameters and assure the permissions owner and group are correct on the files created and or copied so I'll go back and I'm going to cp etc dir colors 
and copy it to etc scale dot the colors and it says that Ian McDonald's written an excellent um, oh it says sorry if, if you wish to customize the color used for different files, file types you can edit the etc the colors file and it's instructions embedded in that or as you've seen for a user they might want to have their own preferences so they'll get their own dot der colors so they can um, modify that um, yeah there's some more tricks to enhance your show maybe where I've got some of those bash tips and tricks from this link that's quite possible so that looks like that's the changes for bash move on as etc vimrc and some user setting files so they've got an example vimrc so these are good settings to have for vim um, I'm not sure if there's one that exists already yes there is so you might want to actually let's see what else is in this one oh. All oh, right, these are personalized. Right, okay, this is personalized, not the global one, because uh, it begins with dot .vimrc. Let's just read what it says here, because it does mention the global setting here. Um, yeah, the LFS book creates a basic vimrc file, which we've just seen. In this section, I attempt to enhance this file. Uh, so it starts up Vim reads the global configuration file as well as you use a specific either or both can be tailored to suit the needs of your particular system um, and here's an ex slightly expanded dot vimrc and you can put it into the etc scale as, instead okay so yeah let's do this let's set it for the root and then copy it into etc scale so there's the first part of it and there's the second part oh yeah and I just realized it's got no we need to actually modify dot vim ask keep doing that lady typing words back to front uh, let's just check we're in the roots home directory we are so vi.vimrc obviously if you're using a different editor or you want to install a different editor you might not be too bothered about this in which case you can skip it and do any modifications to your own editor that you choose so let's copy this again and you notice the comments for the vimrc are a double quote character rather than the usual hash or forward slash so that's the first part of it Oh, I see. It's yes, it's copied that wrong. This is Vim trying to be clever. It's seen that the first lines are quote, and it thinks all the lines are, are quoted, which is incorrect, obviously. So we need to just delete those. It's probably what was happening before with the um, the other script that I copied, where the indentation. Uh, was wrong. It was Vim trying to be clever. So I'll just copy these lines here. That's the next blank line. That's better. And you can see it's even put another empty line there with a quote. Um, wrap margin. I don't think I like having that set actually. Let me just check. My other machine. Yeah, so I normally comment that one out. So it's up to you how you want to do your preferences. You don't have to blindly follow what I do, um, but I like to set obviously my own preferences. So I'll just comment that out. Um, so if I load that up you'll see now uh, 
the number of columns is set to 80 so I think that's how many columns are displayed and this set ruler is the bit that's put all this information down here um, I've got a few other options I use there's one called set show mode I can't remember what that, I think does that show at the moment it says insert down the bottom here. I'm not sure if it puts an insert elsewhere. Let me save that and reload Vim. Um, no, I can't remember exactly what that does now. It could be that that's um, maybe a default that's uh, activated automatically now, whereas in older versions of Vim it didn't used to be. Uh, I've got another setting here called show CMD. I mean, obviously, if you're interested in these commands, you can look up in the, uh, for example, man pages to find out exactly what they do. Yeah, I'm not sure what that does now. Can't see any noticeable difference. Um, and the last one I've got, um, I can't remember what this one does either, but um, I've got the setting set mouse equals R equal R. Um, so whether that does something with the mouse, I don't know. Um, I may be setting options here and I'm not actually using the uh, functionality or or they're providing functionality and I'm blissfully unaware what it's doing. Um, what I can do is have a quick look on the internet. Uh, type in Vim set to show mode to see what it does here. If there's any examples. All oh, right. Okay. So it is for older Unix systems. I thought that's what the show mode was for. So now you've seen when I type insert, it comes dash dash insert in capital letters. Um, it was the case. It says I thought you used to get um, the word insert coming over here on the right hand side. So it's probably not needed on this modern uh, version of Vi. Um, yeah, it says really all this does is show insert online when you're in via insert mode. Well, as you've seen, that's working without that. So if I go back to this and if I actually comment it out, go back into via, if I press I to insert, you can see the inserts come up anyway. So it's kind of redundant, that mode on this version of Vim. So let's see what the other options are for. Uh, let's see if show command is on there. No, it's not on that page, unfortunately. So let's try and find it. Show command is used to show commands which you enter in the file. For example, I'm in the file test to show the commands. I was pointing to this down here, 2D. <clears throat> Okay, let's comment that out. So I can't actually see any difference there.
Oh yes, I just saw that then. Okay, so what that's done, if I insert some blank lines and then go into delete these, I've pressed D once and the D's appeared um, and then, so I know I'm in the delete mode and press D again to delete the line. So that looks like what that's what that's doing. So if I comment this out again, go back in, try and delete one of these on yes I've pressed D and it hasn't shown the D coming up so that does look like that's going to be useful okay so now I'm going to find out what the mouse option does as I say I probably these well the first one was set and it doesn't need to be set anymore with modern vim the second one I'm obviously using it and unwittingly maybe not even noticing or seeing it and not registering that it's an option that I've activated myself set mouse equals R see what this comes up with Oh, mouse equals A prevents the ability of copy and pasting out of Vim with readable characters. Changing mouse equals A to mouse equals R, and that should fix your issue, fix your issue with that. So does that is that saying that you can copy, for example, that from within Vim, quit and then paste? Although I would, have sh I would have thought that GPM would have been copying anyway, so I'm not really sure, without reading further into this, exactly what that's doing. So, um, yeah, it, I, I don't want to dwell on these things too much because um, it's getting away from the actual building of the uh, Beyond Linux and Scratch package, but if that's um, an important thing or looks something like it could be interesting then um, I'll leave you to research it yourself but um, I'll leave it in there now in case I am actually again using it unwittingly without realizing I'm using some functionality um, right so let's go back here um, yes yeah, so what we need to do now now I've made those changes is to copy dot Vim RC into ETC scale. Go back and we've done this bit here. Move in. So customizing your login with ETC issue. Now you don't need to do this particularly. Um, it's something I do set up. Uh, for my LFS boxes because it's just a curiosity really um, with the issue file you can get some interesting information uh, coming back about the system for anybody who logs in um, you can also put as it says here a clear sequence if you want the um, screen cleared at login so if I actually copy this and create the issue file by doing that, clear command, if you don't know already, just clears the screen and it, what it does, it sends a control sequence to the terminal and the terminal acts upon it and knows that um, to clear the screen. Um, what, what we've just done with that is actually send that control sequence to the issue command. So if I cat this, you see what it does is it actually uh, clears the screen because that's what the control characters do so you can't actually view it you can view it in um, VI don't save the file in case it does something to the control characters we can see the control sequence there that's been created um, VI can interpret literally rather than acting upon it as a control character you can see the literal characters 
Now the problem with that is that if I log in and I'm doing stuff and for example I, I want to log out now but I want to retain what's on the screen because of that clear character at the issue it deletes what's on the screen when I log out so that might be a problem um, so if I delete well yes let's log in here again if I remove that file and now I log out you'll see um, sorry no this isn't the logout this is when you log in I beg your pardon this is when you log in um, the clearing of the screen yes that's interesting actually is it because I was already logged in oh that's interesting maybe this is something the kernel's doing is clearing the screen here um, because there's no issue commands oh I well, know another place it could be actually is the init tab yes it's the init tab that's clearing because the first terminal here has got a no clear option so if you do want to retain uh, the contents of the screen without erasing it you'll need to add that no clear option to the init tab so if I, I was working on terminal 3 no terminal 2 so if I modify this file and add the no clear it doesn't matter which uh, order you do this in so if I go to my second ter virtual terminal yeah sorry these are I'm racing ahead here, a bit here these are the options for each virtual terminal which is why there's six of them um, so you can see for TTY1 it never gets cleared on logout um, but by, by setting the clear in the issue, you're telling um, the terminal when it's created to do a clear screen at creation. But uh, this option, no clear, um, because we haven't got an, an issue command with a no clear anyway, this, this is already clearing it automatically. But we're now telling init tab not to clear the screen. So in theory, if I log in, do some stuff, I should do that, log out, and log it. oh maybe that I need to restart the computer to get activate this, now I'm not going to do that because I'll have to set everything up again, yeah unfortunately it's, it's still clearing, um, maybe I could do it on the first screen then, um, let me just put this back to how it was, So if I log out of here, yeah, you can see I've logged out and it hasn't cleared the screen because of that no clear option that's in the init tab. If I log in to root again, um, paste in that command, oh, okay, paste in this command again. So the etc issue has got the clear screen command and again if I now log out it's it's cleared the screen and now it's this time it's not the init tab that's doing it because that's still set to no clear on the first terminal it's that etc issue file that we've created um, so if you do deal with this you get a muddle up as to why the screen's clearing you can't stop it clearing you can see there's several places to look it could even be in the uh, logout we saw the bash logout where it said that the clear command's not put there. So that's something to bear in mind. So if I log back in again, and um, again, once again, delete the issue file, log out, you can see it's now not cleared the screen because the issue file doesn't exist with the clear command. So that, it really is up to you whether you want to have that activated or not, or whether you want to specify it in the um, init tab file or not obviously the init tab file can only be set up by the root um, I'm not sure if there's an etc dot issue for a user to set but if there is then obviously the user can decide whether they want their own terminal to be cleared so as I say I normally do create this file and 
what I do, I create it with some of the options that are specified further down here. These options you can add in um, with various bits of information. So you can see the first one is a B and what I normally do is put something like board rate colon a couple of tabs maybe don't need that many and then you put a backslash in the B the backslash is the escape character and it tells issue that what follows is the letter for the command you want activating so backslash B means insert the board rate of the current line so that'd be good if you're on a remote line over a modem or something it would show the connection rate uh, you can put in the date and that's backslash D um, logically the next one is time there's one there for the time these are all in oh no they're not in a particular order actually but there's one there for current time so put in time backslash T um, yeah system we can put in the next one down so it's backslash S and make it neater. Uh, teletype, I think that's the number or the name of the um, teletype that gets assigned. So like the terminal number if you uh, if you like. So that's backslash L. So like the line number that stands for. Um, what else have we got? You can put in the architecture M and the code name of the machine N which is actually the host name so um, machine is backslash m host name is backslash n so we've got, got the domain name you can put up and the kernel release number so domain so you might not want to put all these up, but certainly some of these would be useful if you're accessing different machines. Um, having these visible at login time um, just makes it obvious what terminal, terminal you're connecting to and reduces a bit of ambiguity. So you know that if you typed in like SSH, whatever, you logged into machine, it reports back these details or certain details that you select so you know you have actually logged into the right machine and you're going to work on the correct machine and not do stuff to a machine uh, thinking you're connected to one but you're actually connected to another um, the U is currently how many users are logged in and lastly V is the uh, version um, of the kernel when it was built so you can put in something like currently and that show the number of users logged in and kernel built slash v and you can combine these all together to into a string so you can put this is backslash n which if you remember is the host name dot backslash o which is the domain name and uh, you can put more information like the system with the machine type and the kernel version number and then follow it for example with the time save that and now this means that when uh, you log in log out sorry you get this prompt coming up so every time I turn on this machine when a new prompt is created I'll get the stuff that's in the issue etc issues file printed up on the screen and it tells me exactly information about this system so it tells me what connection I've got so by default a local virtual terminal connects at this speed it's a technically a virtual speed if you like because it will be running at much faster than that it will show me the date that this a message was printed, the time it was printed, you can see the system is a Linux system TTY2 so you can see am I actually on the virtual terminal 2 at this point if I did the same with this if I log in 
and log out you'll be able to see which terminal I've switched to when I log out if I type the password correctly with one hand um, for log out now you can see it's telling me that I'm on teletype number three teletype terminal number three um, also the machine architecture you can see it's an x86 64-bit the host name iMac which is also reported down here the main name currently not set a domain name so that's correct but when we do come to set a domain name uh, in fact that should have already been set come to think of it um, so that's a bit strange which is in the ETC resolve yeah that's strange it's not reading it from here uh, not sure why that is whether there's some other bit of configuration that needs to be done um, uh, yeah I'm not sure about that uh, it's the kernel version and you can see currently two users are logged in well that's the user that's on my virtual terminal 1 and the user that's on my virtual terminal 5 which is where I've got the browser set so you can see that's reporting that correctly you can also see the build date of the kernel and also the revision number so you can see we've rebuilt the kernel uh, three times well rebuilt it twice because there's initial build and then two more rebuilds um, you can see it's an SMP kernel as it reports a new name minus A I think it is and also the date and time that the kernel was built um, and then there's this string that I've uh, contrived myself at the end of the issues file in fact it might be an idea to um, put a space at the end of that because it's kind of separates the login string so if I log into that uh, sorry the login prompt yeah that's better so the login prompt is now one line away but yeah you can see that I've added in the um, host name the domain name which like I say for some reason not set and then I put in these parameters here the, the uh, system which is Linux the uh, machine architecture and the kernel version and the current time so again you can see that's identical to that so you can configure it how you, how you want to if you want to use that like I say it's probably not that useful on a single machine but if you're accessing this machine from another machine and you access several machines then it could be quite useful to confirm that you're actually logging on to the correct machine so that's that um, go on to the next part which is all about um, number random number generation um, it's just about um, yeah, programs like OpenSSH will benefit this from where well, they need an entry entropy pool so they need a pool of data of random data where they can use random numbers to um, seed uh, various algorithms that are used within the program like SSH does um, and by using this it ensures that a less predictable state is used uh, in generating those random numbers so it says to install it uh, from the BLFS boot scripts package by running this command here so it's just a, a boot script to uh, retain that uh, random entry pool so if we go into sources BLFS BLFS boot scripts and just paste that in and we can even start it now so we've got the random number generator entry pool being saved over reboots now so that is that part done security right so we've moved on to chapter four now so uh, before we move on to that what we need to do is to go to the etc scale directory 
as you can see there's nothing there apparently but we need to do a listing of all the hidden files and you can see that these files here they could become part of the user's uh, file system so we need to remove the read access for group and other this is so that they're only um, readable and writable by the user themselves so to do that we do chmod um, group minus r I'm not sure if you can put two I think you can but we do that on I've got to be careful here um, is if I do, I think that should work. Right, yeah, it's taking that over my SAR as a file name, so I'll have to do it just like that. So if I list all the files again, you can see that the group permissions read access has been deleted. So I'll do the same now for others, over my SAR, and that's gone now for the um, others group so the only person currently that can read these files and write to these files is root anybody that's in the root group can't access them in any way and anybody who's in who's not the root and not in the root group can access them, access them either uh, and that will be the case for when they're used by a user when we create a user so let's create a user now if we do the user add command on its own it gives us a quick um, listing of all the options that are available um, if you want to see the ones that are off the screen just pipe it through less what did I do why doesn't that work correctly user oh maybe it's not going through to the standard output then for some reason which is a bit unfortunate uh, but basically the the option we're particularly interested in is this one here, minus M create home to create the user's home directory. So I'll do user add minus M and then the name of the user. So if we now look at home, we've got a, a user called Kernatex user directory, and if we look inside that with the all files option you can see that all the files that are in the scale directory have been copied automatically into the users directory and they are only accessible by the user and by the user's own group that has also automatically been created so we've now got a user called kernel text an unprivileged user uh, obviously create your own user with your own name now we need to set a password for that user so you type password p a w s w d with the name of the user. Type in a password, and that's done. And that now means that I can log in as that user. And you'll notice I get a green prompt now because I'm an unprivileged user, rather than the red warning me that I'm the root user. If I do set, you can see I've got loads of settings in the environment I use less I can check for the C flags have been set which are, they are there the CXX flags have also been set and also a little bit of the way down make flags has also been set as well so that's good so the basically the <coughs> excuse me the unprivileged user is able to uh, compile with options because they're automatically set the unprivileged user doesn't need to do anything else also I noticed something worth checking that lang environment variable has been set so it knows that um, I'm using the English GB locale with this character set ISO 88591 which is the uh, Western character set um, so that's that probably the only thing I need to check is that I can become the root user uh, so I've just done su minus I type in the root users password 
and yeah, that works okay. So one of the things I will be doing as early as I can is to uh, install sudo, uh, which will allow me to become root temporarily, rather than uh, becoming root permanently, because it uh, can be more secure in certain situations. Another thing I'm going to do is to change into sources. If I show the permissions for the BLFS directory, they're all set to root. Now, ideally, what I want to do is to change them to kernel text, the unprivileged users, so that I can be in that directory as kernel text and uh, do the building there as well. Um, if that could be a security issue, then you might want to build them in the uh, home directory of the unprivileged user and maybe copy the source files if you want to keep them as the root from the users, the unprivileged users directory into the BLFS directory. But um, I'm just going to change the ownership recursively as well in case I need to. Um, I don't need to do anything else. Yeah, I might need to I need to do anything else in that directory. Let's have a look what's in there. No, I probably don't actually. So I'm just going to change the um, ownership of the BLFS directory to kernel text. So that means that as kernel text, oh, done it the wrong way around. So it's changed the username and then the directory you want to change the ownership on. So it should mean that as the user kernel text, I should be able to change into sources BLFS and create files in the BLFS directory. But the existing files will be uh, retained as roots, but I'll still be able to read them as the kernel text user if I need to because I've got the read flag set there. So if I come out of root, change it to the sources BLFS, it should allow me to do that, yes. I can see the files there. I'm just going to create a file as a test. Yes, it's let me create that. There it is there. You can see it's created it as kernel text with the kernel text group. So as I say, if you're concerned about this, you might want to change these to root afterwards. Let me just check I can delete that file as well. Yes, I can. So I'm... Um, okay to carry on as an unprivileged user um, and install packages as that user um, well at least build them I'll have to install them as the root users still to get them embedded in the system so with that I'm going to go to my other terminal and I'm going to go and press backspace to get the current page that I'm on. Double click it to copy it. Let's include that there as well. And the reason is because I'm going to be playing safe. I'm going to come out of this session because I'm in here as root. Uh, you can see it's not even in read the prompts. It shows how much work we've done already doing configuring the system, making it more user friendly if you like. Um, the bash prompt is just a bash prompt whereas uh, as you can see on the new configuration we've added we've got some information, some feedback, we've got the name of the user, we've got green showing that we're unprivileged user and we've also got the path route we're in so it's all very useful information compared to the uh, default prompt that we had before. So I'm going to log out of this log back in as kernel text and I'm going to run links from here with that link and carry on with the book um, from the security chapter.